David and Tom have just outlined, particularly in terms of methodological approaches. Uh, I'm going to talk today about a methodology developed to look at wider landscape of heritage assets. And this was a project which, um, you know, followed on from the Atkins report, and you were talking about earlier, so it's one of the, the case pilot studies, um, which was commissioned on the back of that. Um, I co-lead it, I'm Andy Howard of Landscape Research. Um, I co-lead it with David Knight, who's in the audience from uh, York Archaeological Trust. And we've gone for the prize for most logos today, but I think it's a very important <laughs> point, actually, because there's been a lot of talk about interdisciplinary research and needing to talk to other disciplines. So on this team, we have Tom Corfard, who's a, so, so I'm a geomorphologist really by trade, although I've been kicking around in archaeology for a long time. <coughs> David's obviously you know, a thoroughbred archaeologist. Um, Tom from the University of Hull is a computer modeler. He's a fluvial geomorphologist, but he's a computer modeler. Uh, David Kossoff and Karen Hudson-Edwards are from Birkbeck University of London. They're geochemists. And Steve Malone is also from, from uh, York, uh, York Archaeological Trust. One of the things we also did with this project, and we felt it was really important, was to have buy-in. So um, we've got uh, WN Council on board, because they are obviously the custodians of the World Heritage Site. And we also have um, the Derwent Valley Mills World Heritage Site people, so Mark Suggett and his team, who are basically the practitioners on the ground managing the World Heritage Site on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, well, really just to sort of reiterate some of the points uh, made earlier, um, obviously some pictures of uh, you know, um, natural hazards, natural events happening, uh, particularly flooding, obviously Tewkesbury 2007. Um, this was very much antecedent conditions, so several weeks of heavy rain. Um, Tewkesbury is at the uh, junction of the Seven and the Avon, so it's a confluence zone, uh, and as Neil said earlier, you know, some people knew where to build there, to put their buildings in the past. Um, obviously, Boss Castle 2004, this was a very localised, intense rainfall event. Um, I must admit, if I had sort of car put it past <coughs> my window, I think the last thing I would be doing is getting my phone out to uh, take a picture of this. Um, but there's, there's a serious point here, which is, a lot of the time when we think about natural hazards, climate change, natural events, we think we, we focus towards um, key individual heritage assets. And what we want to try and do today is, is sort of broaden it out and think about methodologies for looking at entire landscapes. Um, because one of the points is dealing with individual assets is very challenging, and you know that from the talks this morning. But you know. How do you respond when you have multiple assets? And you know, each one of those assets, you know, individually is important, but together that's what forms the integrity of the actual heritage record and the designation. And you know, the Durham Valley Mills World Heritage Site is one such example of you know, it's not just a single asset, it's multiple assets, and, and all of those assets come together to um, you know sort of find the integrity of the resource and, and the listing as a World Heritage Site. Um, obviously based on the textile industry, I'll, I'll come back to that in a, in a minute. Um, but the Derwent Valley Mills isn't alone. Um, it's one of a series of industrial landscapes. And it's, these are landscapes where, where the physical environment and the heritage resort are so intimately related. And as I say, it's a, it's a series of them. This is, this is the world. World Heritage Site Map for, for Britain, and I've just put in red, obviously, the Durban Valley Mills here in Derbyshire is in uh, yellow. But, you know, red assets, these are industrial World Heritage Sites. Um, Colebrook Dale at the bottom there, that's the Iron, so the Iron Bridge Gorge, is, is sort of down here. The Iron Bridge is, is somewhere in this distance here. Um, there's a real paradox with these sites, because the physical assets, which actually um, go a long way to defining why these historic sites are where they are, are actually some of the most vulnerable sites to climate change. Some of the most vulnerable to, you know, geomorphological change, landscape sensibility. These sites were put there because, you know, you had very good gradients for water power, you had steep slopes, you had natural resources, coal, limestone, um, metal walls. So, they're there for a reason, but actually they're very, very sensitive now in terms of response. And, you know, 
The Iron Bridge Gorge, these museums down here in Colebrookdale, have been flooded several times over the last few years. Um, if you look at DEFRA and Environment Agency definitions, these are what are known as rapid response catchments. So Boz Castle is a rapid response catchment. Colebrookdale and Iron Bridge is a rapid response catchment. It just responds very quickly, especially if you stick a big thunderstorm over it for several hours and have an intense rainfall event, the sort of rain we all were showing earlier. Um, so what's the aim of this paper, really? Well, the aim is to sort of look at the methodological approach we developed as part of this project to look at the wider landscape, the development of that landscape, and looking at the heritage assets within it. Just some key facts about the Derwent Valley Mills and Rural Heritage Service. I'll just refer to it as the Derwent Valley from now on. But as I say, it's, it's, it's a good stretch. It's 24 kilometres. So Matlock Bath is up here, Matlock, um, the edge of the southern edge of the Peak District. Derby down here. You've got 24 kilometres. And within that 24 kilometre stretch of valley floor, you have a series of assets of the Rural Heritage Site. And as I say, there are multiple assets. We're dealing with major mill complexes, but also the, the associated infrastructures of workers' houses, churches, schools, public houses. Um, and also includes major historic waterman assets. Well, that's weirds to you and me at this point in time. Big weirds within the valley. Um, and these are all the way along this valley floor. I'll show some pictures in a moment. Now, the current river is very heavily regulated. Um, the last of the rivers are the Howden, the Derwent, and the last uh, reservoir, Lady Bower, um, was the last of the three completed in 1943. They started being completed back in 1912, 1913. Um, but Daniel Defoe, on his tour of, 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 of England, talked about a river of fury. So that gives you some idea of what the Derwent Valley was like and what its potential is. The other point to bear in mind is obviously the World Heritage Site is based on the textile industry, so the 18th, 19th century textile industry. That's what the definition is all about. But aside from that, the area has been impacted by historic metal mining, principally lead and zinc in the Derwent. There are other metals involved if you go to other tributary systems of the Trent. But um, lead and zinc are the primary ones, and we have incredibly heavily contaminated floodplains. Some of these floodplains have greater concentrations of metal than some of the uh, present economically exploited ore deposits around the world. So there is a, an argument you can go back to some of these places and start mining the floodplains, um, which is a whole different talk. <laughs> um, and this is where Karen and David have come in because they're geochemical specialists, so we brought them into the project to, to look at the, the metal mining record. Just to give you a flavour of the assets, um, this is the top end of the catchment, massive mills, just at Matlock Bath, you can see the Matlock Gorge there. Um, that's the edge of the limestone, basically, so we come off the limestone onto carbon for sandstone and shales. The limestones are where the metal ores are, so that's where they've been deposited and exploited. Time. Come a bit further down the catchment, you know, six or seven kilometres, you've got Belper, one of the major towns, East Mill Complex here, and notice this, you know, lovely set of horseshoe weir systems. So these are major, major monuments. Major monuments. Um, down towards Derby, Darling Abbey Mills. I put this one on primarily because this is where our fish passage has just gone in. So, you know, Neil was hinted at earlier the water framework directive. Um, there was a, a fish passage put through by the Environment Agency probably a couple of years ago. In case of some archaeology, probably enough. Um, and then the lowest one, this is the first mill, the silk mill in Derby, which is 1721. Yeah, so um, that's the first one you can see. These are all next to the river, obviously, because they're exploiting the power. Um, now, aside from the World Heritage Site, why is metal? Why is mining contamination within this landscape? Why do we need to think of that? You know, it's not related to the World Heritage Site. What, what's it all about? Well, if you look at empirical evidence from the Little Ice Age, what we know from the North Pennine ore field is that 
a lot of the rivers changed their characters. They went from being single channel, single channel river systems, relatively stable within the landscape, to multi-channel braided systems. So they, they extended 100 meters across the floodplain. Well, why do they do that? Well, it's very simple, which is basically, as climate deteriorates, you get bigger floods coming through the system. The bigger floods remobilize these metal contaminants. The metal contaminants spread across the floodplain. They kill the vegetation. So the river doesn't have a chance to respond. Um, sorry, the, the vegetation doesn't have a chance to respond to actually um, you know, recolonize, rebind the banks, make it all nice again. Now, those floods coming through the Little Ice Age just create a channel. So, and you can see here where the metal mining areas are in Britain. So, if you look at the World Heritage site of this, or the map earlier, I should have perhaps put them on together, and that map, there's a, there's a strong correlation of where we've got these industrial landscapes, where we have these pollution issues. Um, so, so, the sort of hypothesis we were working on was, well, could this happen in the Derwent again? Could you get climatic deterioration? Could you get big floods coming through? Could you get remobilization of these metal deposits? Could you get broadening of the floodplain? Um, so how did we look? You know, how did we how did we sort of start to characterize this landscape, build this multi-asset picture? Um, well, we went for two stages, and the first stage was basically to look at how the floodplain, how the valley floor has developed over the last millennium, so that, over the last thousand years. Now, there's a very good reason to do that, which is within the last thousand years we have two periods of climatic instability, which are incredibly well documented. J.M. Grove wrote his book, The Little Ice Age, in 1977. You know, that's 40 years ago. Um, so, we have the medieval war period, about 900, 300 AD, and the Little Ice Age, 1450 to 1850, you can argue about the preciseness of these dates, but that's broadly when they are. So we said, let's have a look at how the valley floors responded over the last thousand years, how it's evolved over the last thousand years, and let's see if we can use that as a, as a model for what might happen in the future. So we pulled together various data sources, we also went and looked at the documentary cartographic records, we mapped um, landform assemblages, so you know, paleo channels, terraces, um, areas of flooding within the valley floor, that from uh, uh, LIDAR data. We looked at the geochemical record, there's a lot of information with people at the BGS just saying, you know, how contaminated is the valley floor, what can you say about it? And then obviously we pulled in all the historic environment asset uh, records for the period, um, so, you know, the, the high medieval modern, and we incorporated all this within a, within a GIS environment. Um, so what does, it, what does it sort of tell us, you know, what are the headlines coming out of this? Well, if you look at the um, early Ordnance Survey maps, which take you back about 200 years, although the, uh, the, the river's sort of wiggling around a little bit, it's pretty much where it is now. It's been pretty stable within the valley floor. And that stability probably initially relates to um, the river on what I call river on furniture, or weirs and revetments associated with the textile industry, but also we have major infrastructure going through the valley, so the railway, the canal, the road, the A6, it's, you know, it's, it's kept it in place and if there's been any problems, they've shored it up. Um, obviously within the last 70 years we've had regulation by the reservoir, so that's helped as well. Um, however, if you look at LiDAR imagery for the valley floor, um, this is just the, the lower part between uh, Little Eaton and Malastry, which is pretty much just north of Derby. Um, and you, you look at the landform assemblages. Well, in yellow is, is all the paleo channels, and also what's known as uh, ridge and swale topography. These, these nice, curvy <coughs> ridges, which basically show how the river has moved. When the river migrates, you get point bars developing these sedimentary depositional deposits and they basically form ridges, so you can tell which way the channel's gone, the river's migrated at some point that way. Um, we also have historic environment assets in green, these are, these are polygons, and there's quite a lot of ridge and furrow. Now you don't have to be a, you know, a sort of geomorphologist or a geoarchaeologist to realise if you, if you um, look back there, not a lot of change over 200 years, 
But if you look here, there's quite a lot going on with this valley floor. Look at that nice paleo channel there, which basically mirrors about the same amplitude. So it's carrying about the same amount of water as the contemporary river. The river's clearly moved backwards and forwards across its floodplain in that zone. Um, the ridge and furrow is important because in many areas, and um, we identified quite a lot of new ridge and furrow and uh, HGR records actually by doing this, but there are areas where you can see that the ridge and furrow is just eroded away by you know, the fluvial activity. So clearly sometime before the last 200 years, there's a lot of mobility in this valley floor. And I'll come on to why that is in a minute. Um, so what we did was we, we you know, basically put the, all this information together in the GIS, um, overlaid the historic environment records onto uh, the valley floor, and you know, we've used that as a, as a, as a model for um, basically looking at spatial patterning, looking at hotspots within the record where we can see historic environment assets that are closely related to you know, contemporary geomorphology and past geomorphology. So that was stage one of the project. But what we didn't want to do was we didn't want to just stop there in terms of an assessment. So what we then started doing was thinking about well, how do we look at what's going to happen in the future. And this is where Tom Colfard from the University of Hull comes in because he's a computational modeler who developed something called the Caesar List Flow model. And I'll, I'll go through it in a minute. But basically what we decided to do was try and look at how the river and the valley floor might respond over the next generation, effectively, the next 30 years of time, and how that might impact on the historic environment record. So what goes into the, the Caesar this flood model, and this has been evaluated over about 20 years, so you know it's, it's been rigorously reviewed in geomorphological journals, it's not just some you know top model we thought we'll give it a go. It's, it's very, very well established and very well respected. Um, well, basically, you start with a topographic background, which we obviously derive from the LIDAR data, so that gives you your surface model. Um, and then you look at things like contemporary rainflow data, and you look at um, uh, river flow data, and you start running the model, um, and you, you bring in information on bank composition, because obviously that affects the roadability of the channel backwards and forwards. You bring in information on things like uh, weirs, uh, channel obstructions, anything which is going to affect the internal flow dynamics. And what you do with that is you basically run the model to calibrate it, to get um, a contemporary idea of what the channel is doing, and then you go out and you look to see if that you know, equates to what you can see on the ground. So is, is the model showing what the actual channel is doing? Once you've got to that stage, well, you can then start throwing in other variables. And the one which is obviously very important is predicted weather. And this comes from Na uh, National uh, Met Office Climate Models. And um, basically, we use those as drivers to put bigger floods down the catchment um, and see how the catchment's going to respond. And what that gives you is an erosion sedimentation index, effectively. Um, and basically areas here, it gives you a 20, um, 20 square meter grid cell and it tells you what's happening in that 20 square meter grid cell. So this is the valley floor here. Uh, basically more red equals more erosion, uh, more purple equals um, more deposition and yellow is obviously somewhere in between. But the key thing about that is obviously, you know, that on its own is very pretty but what we want to do is then overlay the HER assets onto that model so that we can pick up areas in red areas in red where we have intense erosion um, and we can pick up areas <coughs> in green where there's where there's less erosion perhaps more <coughs> and notice some of these paleo channels um, are act act actively reactivating so areas which have been um, active in the past, but now paleo channels could become active again in the future. Right, key headlines. Okay, ordnance survey maps show that from since the 1820s, the channel's been pretty stable within the valley floor. Prior to the 1820s, um, there's been significant channel mobility. Now we could probably sit here all day arguing about when precisely ridge and furrow is um, within the landscape, but if for sake of argument. 
And from analogies elsewhere within the East Midlands, we're talking about the High Middle Ages, perhaps expansion of agriculture onto the floodplain during the medieval warm period. Could it be that the climatic response to climate deterioration in the Little Ice Age was actually the erosion of those features on the floodplain? So, so we've got a model developed. You know, there's a lot more work to do, but I think we've got a working hypothesis. Um, we certainly know there were major floods during the Little Ice Age, but the regulation of the catchment lessened this threat. We certainly know that the valley floor is heavily contaminated, and we really need to take that into consideration if we don't remobilize those sediments, because then we're going to get all sorts of complex feedback going on. One of the interesting things about the geochemistry was that obviously we've got the mining sites themselves which are contributing um, contaminants to the valley floor. But actually, the upland peaks, these upland areas in the upper Derwent Valley, have significant heavy metals held within the peaks, which are the products of atmospheric fallout associated with industrial activities in places like Manchester. Now, currently, most of, well, a lot of that material which is eroded is, is held in storage in the reservoirs, although it's difficult to get Seth Trent to talk about this. <laughs> um, but, you know, if you want to sort of change dynamics in the future and how those, uh, how regulation works within the catchment, it's a very important point to bear in mind. Um, and modeling demonstrates there's localized erosion of the channel banks, reactivation of former channels, and the future scenarios of climate change. At one point, we did strip the weirs out as well, just to see what that would do. But that's a, that's a different talk, again, for another time. What are the key messages? Well, individual heritage assets need to be considered within the wider landscape. You really do need to think about landscape inheritance. You cannot, you know, there's, there's no point in flood-proofing a building in Durban Valley if you don't start considering these wider issues like metal mining. You know, it's, it's part of a wider dialogue, I think, is, is what I'm saying. Um, I think we've, we've demonstrated um, the value of linking empirical geoarch research with modeling. And the point I would make is, you know, job, you know somebody made the point earlier about um, borrowing from other disciplines. You know, geographers have been doing landscape modeling for probably 25 years now. And I can't think of many um, examples of it being used in archaeology. I think this is one of the few, actually. Um, it's obviously a methodology for looking at climate change on the historic environment. And you know, what we'd like to do is obviously use this to go on and look at other World Heritage sites, industrial contaminated sites, perhaps. Devon and Cornwall is an obvious one, but there are others, so we've got an agenda for that. And I think, you know, obviously we've talked about World Heritage Sites here, but this is a generic template for thinking about consideration of wider heritage resource and climate change, and I'll leave it there. Thank you.